Hey Flashaholics, today's video will cover Manker's E14. This video will cover both versions of the light, the 219B Nichia in neutral white, as well as the XPG2 version in cool white. Now either light comes in a outer sleeve with this packaging cardboard box, ample foam in here. Within was a spare o-ring, a clip, and a wrist strap. So digging into this light, what can I say? Wow, they just continue to impress me with their releases. Before we even get into any designs and features, the one thing that you cannot see here is a BLF A6 driver that lies in the heart of this light. It was a custom designed driver, I believe by Toy Keeper, and the firmware is available for those who wants to take a crack at reprogramming it. But if you've been a Flashaholic for any length of time, you would know that a driver is extremely important, not just from governing the output, but also controlling the user interface. And the user interface can make or break a light because regardless of how much output or the quality of the light, if that user user interface sucks, well, it's going to make it very hard to like a light. It also plays a huge part in the purchase decision, as well as whether or not one would decide to ultimately keep a light or flip it. So anyway, getting into this light, right off the bat, you can see there's a TRR optic that is housed over those four. Um, this particular one is the Nichia 219Bs in neutral white. The bezel is flat, so it lies perfectly flat with no way of being able to discern whether or not the light is on. Given the output that this little light is capable of, this is a single cell 18350 or 16340-CR123 slash size light, and it can pump out 1400 lumens in the Nichia version. So thereby they went with a all copper core here at the throat of the light, if you will, because that helps dissipate the heat that's definitely needed considering what this light is capable of. Now the, both the body and the tail cap feature some knurling. It's okay, it's not the most aggressive, but it does help in use. The tail cap does feature these two flare guards here, so thus allowing it to be used in candlelight mode. Not the most stable, but still not bad in a pinch. And on one side of the tail guard are these two holes that you could attach the wrist strap to. Now getting the tail cap off, you'll see that the threads are fully anodized and even though it's not square cut, it operates quite smoothly. The tail cap side features a spring, even though this tube here is fairly short, given that there is also a spring on the other side, that allows a decent range of battery length. So this is my longest cell, this is Ultrafire 18350. That actually measures closer to 37 millimeters. And here's the AWIMR that measures closer to 35 millimeters, but no problems with accommodating either cell. Now while the tail cap came decently greased, I felt like the throw of the light was not as well greased. And here you can see that the copper left some material on the threads here. So my advice is, whenever possible, try not to disassemble the head. You don't want those threads getting loose over time. And here you can see under the head, there lies the BOF A6 driver. Now one thing though is that if you do plan to grease this tube to the throat of the light, try to use like a thicker grease or perhaps just don't go overboard because again, you don't want it to interfere. You really want to put a light grease on this end so that way when you twist this off, you're not also twisting the body off as well. So this bezel was on tight but it is removable. And getting that off, you're going to see there's the bezel, there's the o-ring, there's the glass. And this glass is AR coated as you can see there, double sided. Keep in mind o-ring on the outside. The optics is removable. I'm not familiar with all of the TIR optics. I do know that there are varying degrees. They don't specify the exact degree of the TIR optic being used, but I do feel that this was more geared towards throw. And here you can see the emitter board with the Quad Nichia 219Bs here. And here's a close-up shot of that. Now those two screws look like they come off easily, so the emitter board should be easily replaceable. Since I have a review to conduct, I'm not going to bother disassembling that for now, but in the future I might get around to that and I'll post updates later on. Now one additional thing I did want to cover, of course, I gotta disclaim, use this at your own discretion, is that if you wanted to, you could actually remove the optic and use the light without it, so that gives you a true no hotspot. Not that the beam with the optic is bad at all by any means, but if you really want a much broader beam, this is what your no optic use would look like. Although, of course, there are some artifacts around the edges, as you can see there. That's actually the reflection of the copper. But again, if you so chose to, you could use the light in this way. Now, one thing of note is that given that there is no optic pushing on the glass, it, it can be a little loose, at least with the Nichia version. The glass was actually rattling around there, but on the XPG, it seems like a little bit tighter fit. 
But anyway, that's another way that you could potentially use this light. Again, with the caveat that potentially this may not be fully waterproof in this mode. The included clip is reasonably deep and allows for pretty secure hold when clipped. And as usual with the flare guards, you just gotta be mindful of where you position this so that way it doesn't interfere with your grip because your thumb must always be between these screws. While the clip is reversible so you could use it in bezel up carry, I wouldn't really suggest it only because this sticks out so you can't really easily use it in candlelight mode. The clip is also just barely thick enough so provided the bill of your cap is not too tight, you can kind of use it in a makeshift headlamp. And given that it is a short stubby light, no problems with it banging into your forehead. And it does clip on reasonably tight in this way, so I feel reasonably secure. Now, a quick tip for those of you who installed it this way and are having a hard time getting it off, just remove the tail cap carefully because this does apply pressure on it. And just simply yank it up this way, being mindful of the O-ring, of course, and the threads. And voila, that's an easier way to get it off. I know that steel clips, or in this case titanium coated steel clips, are standard in the industry, but I've just never been fond of using it, only because it scuffs up the light. I don't expect this one to be a shelf queen, but still, I do like to keep my equipment nice and clean. And as you can see here, it's already been scuffed up from the attachment of the clip. So my challenge to the industry is, can you guys think of something that you could use in lieu of steel that would be just as strong and durable, but won't cause scuffing to the light? Size-wise, here it is compared to other 18350 size lights. This is Prometheus Alpha, this is their Manker's Timeback Copper, and of course E14 there. And here you can see it runs about mid-pack compared to the other CR123 size lights in my collection. In the interest of time, I'm not going to bother identifying them, but if you have any questions, just throw in a comment. Now about that UI, when I first saw this, I was like, wow, this is so complicated. I mean, it almost looks like an astrological sign or something like that. But... Once you familiarize yourself with it, it's actually very straightforward. Basically, there are two modes that you can program the light into. One is the simple mode, which they labeled here as group two, and that features a low mode, medium, high, and turbo. And group one is, I guess you could say the advanced mode, which gives you seven levels of moon, low, medium one, medium two, high one and two, and then turbo. Regardless of which mode that you're in, there are also these four hidden modes that you can access by pressing for at least half a second to between one and a half seconds from moon mode. So let's just say from moon mode, if you press for at least half a second, you'll enter directly into turbo and then another half a second to go into a tactical strobe, then a battery check, and then last but not least, a bike flasher. How you switch between these two modes, group one and group two, is that you'll actually tap about 15 times. Okay, once you reach a certain time, you're gonna see the light actually shut off and blink twice. And then after that first set of blinks, if you turn on and off the light really quickly, that'll switch you between the seven or the four modes, so group one or group two. Now this instruction here actually has a mistake. This click actually belongs here. So same thing, you tap your 15 times and you wanna program whether or not the light remembers memory mode. So you'll enter your first set of blinks, but don't shut your light on and off there because like I said, that only programs your group one or group two modes. Wait for the second set of blink, then shut the light on and off. That will then program whether or not your light memorizes the last output level. Now these four hidden modes are never memorized. So now we get into the UI output levels, the group one, group two modes, that is, the programming of them, as well as the memory function, and then being able to access the hidden modes. Currently, I do have the exposure fixed on sunny white balance, so this is pretty close to what I'm seeing in real life. I do have the light program into the simple four level output levels, that's the group two. It's currently on its lowest mode. A quick press will cycle it up, medium, high, turbo ad nauseum. Now the great thing about this is that a half a press will actually cycle back down to the lower level, meaning a half a second. So if you press and hold for at least half a second, let go, it'll go back down. You see that? That is awesome, man. So that way you don't have to keep cycling through the high levels to get to the output level that you want. You could go up or half a press to come back down. That is really awesome. To access the hidden mode from the lowest mode, press and hold for at least half a second. Now enter the turbo mode, but this is not the output level now, this is the hidden mode. Another half a second enters a fixed rate tactical strobe. Another half a second, 
This will go into a battery checker mode with each blink representing about 25%. So it's interesting, as you saw that, it started off with three blinks, then it went back to four because the resting voltage increased coming out of the turbo and the tactical strobe. So after the battery checker, next one is a bike flasher. Now that's pretty cool. I've seen this before on certain bikes. It's not a fixed rate strobe which some bikers use which I'm not fond of at all because I don't know about the laws governing the roads but you just want to warn people that hey you're there but at the same time though you don't want to impersonate a emergency vehicle. So this is really cool. And then cycling after this re-enters back into moon mode. Now to program the light from group 2 to group 1 which is the advanced mode with 7 output levels Simply keep pressing half presses and quickly turn on and off when you see that first set of two blinks. So there you saw there were seven output levels. Let me put it down. This one has a true moonlight mode as you can see there. It's a very low level. This is lower than the low mode of the group two. So you start off in moonlight mode. Quick half press will enter low. Another half press will enter medium. Medium 2, high 1, high 2, last but not least, turbo. Back into moonlight mode. Entering the hidden modes is no different here. I'm not going to cover it in depth, but just to show you, this is currently in that moonlight mode. A quick half a second press will enter turbo and into the hidden modes. Now to program the memory mode, it's the same thing as before. You go into your half presses with the light on. First set of blinks, wait. Second set of blinks, turn light on and off. Now this will enter memory mode. So case in point, I'm gonna go into medium one. Keep it there, shut the light off. Turn it back on and as you can see, it's memorized. We're gonna simulate a battery change by locking it out, turning it back on, and as you can see, it memorizes it. So overall, very, very cool user interface. Gives you the convenience of either a four mode or if you want the more advanced seven levels, the opportunity to go forward or backwards, back down as you saw there, or go up a level. And the access to hidden modes from the lowest mode, that's just simply awesome, man. Love this UI. Although I gotta say though, you really gotta play around with it a little bit because I find that the length of pressing as well as sometimes even the way that you press it it, it's a little flaky, so sometimes I couldn't get it to program right. I couldn't get it to go up or down in the level. So again, you really got to spend some time playing around with it to master it. So now we get to the runtime. There's a lot going on here, but bear with me. If you're familiar with my runtime charts, I typically list the light as well as the maximum lumens that the manufacturer claims up here. Given that there are two different versions, the Nitria 219B is capable of up to 1400 lumens, XPG2 up to 1600. And over here, I've split it apart where there are two runs for each light. The reason being that I used one UltraFire protective cell, 18350 sized, and I also ran it again with the AWIMR. Now the caveat here is that these batteries are actually kind of old. I've been hunting for new ones, but haven't really found them yet. So I wanted, I think, what was it? The AFT, ABT, I can't remember. But anyway, it was tested by HKJ to be one of the best 18350 cells or maybe even the key powers, but unfortunately I still don't have them. So maybe in the future, I'll rerun this when I get the 18650 tube. But for now, again, the caveat is that these batteries are old. They're not particularly good. First of all, the UltraFire is a protective cell. AWIMR, even if it's not, it's gone through many deep discharge cycles. So with that out of the way, the story here seems to be that these lights seem to be capable of the manufacturer claims. These dotted lines, they represent the temperature and they match the corresponding color for the runs. So this light blue line here, that's the XPG2 on an ultra fire cell. The darker color is the XPG2 version on an AW cell. Likewise, for the Nichia 219B, that's the one that runs on the ultra fire, and the darker one is on the AW cell. Unfortunately, I lost the data for the AW run on the XPG2, but I don't expect it to be very different than you know what you're seeing here. 
All right, so first of all, sorry, I, I know I've jumped around the place, but let's get back to the total runtime. For the Nichia 219B on the Ultra Fire Cell, they claim 2,500 milliamps an hour. I think that's a little inflated, but anyway, achieved 24 minutes. This is again according to ANSI FL1 standards, whereby that's the total runtime after the light drop below 10% of the value recorded at 30 seconds, which was 1,080 lumens. So as you can see, they each started pretty high, you know, like say the XPG2 version started as high as like mid 1700s, but just took a nosedive. And that's pretty much the story for all of them. They start off reasonably high, but they all take a nosedive immediately. It actually does that for 45 seconds and there's a drop down, although you can't see that here in the raw data, which is here, you'll see that there is a step down after the 45 second mark. So the common theme here is that they all take a nosedive immediately after turn on. I need to find out from Menker which cell they used and hopefully you know get the same cell to try to replicate this again. The bottom line is that after it takes a nosedive, it tries to maintain kind of like you know quasi-regulated run, but because it is using PWM, but of such a high frequency that you know eyes can't detect it, but obviously the sensor can, so thus you see this zigzaggedy line here. Now the total average for the entire run for the Nichia 219B using the ultrafire cell was 462 lumens there. Okay. When it gets to a point where I think it can no longer maintain, you know, that run, it kind of just takes another step down and maintains almost a near perfectly regulated run, and they all end up around that range. I think that's around 30 to 40 lumens. But by that time, the cells are pretty depleted, so I really wouldn't recommend it running, you know, for extended periods during that time. All of the ending voltage was taken reasonably close to after the light shut off, so there wasn't a huge resting period. But still, as you can see, those are just not healthy numbers for any cell to maintain for an extended period of time. Now, you got to remember, this is resting voltage, so under load, it was probably below that, but likely not below 2.8 volts because the driver will completely shut down the light if it goes below 2.8 volts. What I was actually surprised by was that the AW cells actually didn't fare well. And again, caveat that my AW cells are pretty old by now, but still, I kind of expected a little better showing than, especially, you know, ultra fire cells. In both cases, whether it's the 219B or the XPG2, the ultra fire outdid the AW. So again, I'm going to be on the hunt for new cells, unprotected ones, of course, that could deliver a high amperage and then rerun these tests. But bottom line is that the... XPG2 fared a little bit better with the Ultra Fire Cell. I recorded 1270 at 30 seconds, only 689 for the AW, and the entire average run for the Ultra Fire was 703 and AW at 313. In terms of the temperature, the Ultra Fire with the maximum output on the XPG2 did achieve the highest. Now 120 again, that's the upper limits of scalding, so you really need to pay attention. Don't leave the light unattended for extended periods of time. I do always use a fan with a light breeze blowing during the runtime testing because it kind of simulates the cooling a little bit when you have the light handheld because, you know, again, your body acts as a heat sink for these lights. So anyway, that's the story there. I will rerun this when I get the 18652 tube or the new 18350 cells. So I'm currently outdoors in the afternoon sun. It's roughly about 6 p.m. now. The color temperature should be a little bit on the warmer side. I'm guesstimating about 4,500. The 219B was claimed to be around 5,000, but to me, I don't know, it seems to be a little bit warmer than that. So here you can see on the left hand here, I'm going to just put this right next to the stone, that's the color temperature, and it matches that pretty closely to this real sunlight there, as you can see. So there I'm shining directly on the sunlight spot, as you can see there. And here in the shadows to give you a better idea. And it matches this sunlight pretty well right now. By comparison, here's the XPG2 version. Get it to a comparable output. So therein lies the difference. You see the XPG2 version on my left, that's the cool white version. And the 219B on my right hand. I mean, it should be obvious, but... And here it is uh, shining on a sunlight spot. So bottom line is that if you care more about the tent, definitely the neutrals for you. But if you want that little extra in output and a little bit more in throw, then go for the XPG2 version. Now we get to Manker's E14 with the four 
Nichia 219Bs. It's on the highest output mode. And it's just got a really nice gorgeous tint to it. It's got a very nice floody beam profile with no true hot spots, so this is just absolutely awesome for camping. It doesn't have that kind of like tunnel-like vision view. Great for navigating, especially uh, in use inside the tent, which I'll get to later. But this is on the highest setting. This is now in um, the, the second group mode, which has much, uh, hot, much more different output levels. And there, as you can see, the step down for the turbo but if I press it again, I could re-engage turbo. Okay, I'm gonna hit the nice little moonlight mode here, as you can see. And it's just barely making an impact on the pole. Sorry, I need to keep it down because people are sleeping under tent, so next level up. Slightly brighter low level. Don't remember the exact mode names off the top of my head, but I'll put it into the caption. Next level up. You know, there was a time during the height of my flash ecologism that I really lost it after one of those over-ready modular. I just thought it was so cool to have over a thousand lumens in a compact light that's no bigger than a CR123 size. And finally, I own one, although of course it's not an over-ready one, but this one is pretty cool nonetheless. Love the fact that it has quad emitters, although of course the runtime in that sustained turbo mode is very short, right? Because it'll cut down after 45 seconds. And even then without the cut down, you're still looking at a steep drop as you saw in the runtime chart. So it really is more for showing off in short blasts, but the UI is really what makes or breaks this light. I love the ability to be able to either advance forward to go to a higher level or through half a press come back down. Those hidden modes, I don't know how often I'll use them, but it's cool to have, you know, I don't think I'll ever mount this on a bike, but that bike flasher mode, I like that strobe. Battery checker is handy. And the ability to program between, you know, your advanced seven output level or the other group two mode, which is, you know, the four output levels, that's a really nice to have. Now, I suppose that later on, I may actually disassemble this just to take a look inside. I'll post it in my written review, but for now, here are my initial thoughts. Overall fit and finish, this light comes together solidly. I have no complaints about it. The engraving is flawless. The copper, just gotta be careful. Over time, it will develop a pantina, so it won't stay this nice and shiny. I don't know, there's probably products out there that you could use to freshen it up, meaning if you care for that, but the pantina look is not too bad. It looks pretty cool. So here's the time back copper that you can see that the outer rims where, you know, my hands has touched and I guess I left oil has developed a darker shade versus the inside here, which I really didn't touch. It's still that original light copper mode. So that could be potentially cool. I don't know. That's just personal preference and subjective. But wrapping up the fit and finish, all the edges are fully deburred. There are no flaws with it. The threads operate all smoothly. Like I said, the only nitpick I had was about the throat of the light not coming grease as well as the bezel. But then again, I guess they didn't really intend for you to remove that. So the clip, as I mentioned, it's a pain in the butt, but that's an industry standard, right? It's metal on metal. You're bound to scuff it up and cause some scratching there. The flare guards, never been particularly fond of this particular style, but I do see the point of it because it does help mitigate it from accidentally turning on. Not fully though, of course, so if you want to, you can lock the light out by giving a quick twist, so that way, no problems there. As I mentioned, it's really the UI. It, this is just one nice solid package for the price that they're asking. It's a fraction of one of those over-ready modular. The caveat there though, as I had mentioned earlier in the UI and output levels, is that you really gotta spend some time with this light to master it because 
the amount of presses as well as the way that you press it it's very sensitive you're gonna have some finesse to really be able to go through it the way that you want to so that's one caveat there but beyond that I think it offers great bang for the buck. I can't wait to get the 18650 tube so I could test the runtime as well as new batteries. Unfortunately, my batteries aren't great. You know, the Ultra Fire was protected cell, so I don't think that gives it the full amp that this can utilize. And then my AWIMR sadly are older cells that's gone through many deep discharge cycles from my review. So thereby, again, I don't think it's getting the amperage that it could have. So stay tuned for a future update, but you know, check out the thread, check out my full written review. In the meanwhile, wow, kudos, Mankers. You guys are really on the ball with your latest releases. Great job, man. As part of FTC disclosure, the Manker E14 Nichia version was provided by Manker for review. The XPG2 version was purchased for my personal use. Thanks again for watching.